My name's Mark Callahan, Mr. Saltwater Tank. I run a website called Mr. Saltwater Tank and have a show on YouTube called Mr. Saltwater Tank TV. Has anyone not heard of me before this moment and it's okay if you haven't? Awesome, you're in the right place. Okay, so I have a show on YouTube and it's evolved along the years. Now I spend most of my time doing custom installs uh, across the nation. This is one in Virginia. Here's one in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, and then another one in Virginia. I also run all the video marketing for saltwateraquarium.com, a platinum sponsor of Aquashella. And then I have a new venture out called the Reef and Report, which is a new aggregation site. So if you're in the saltwater aquarium world, you want to go one-stop shop to find out all the relevant news in the saltwater aquarium, that's what the Reef and Report is about. We do a live stream every Sunday night as well. So if you're home tomorrow night, or even if you're not, because now we have phones and you can watch anything anywhere, uh, we'll be live on Sunday nights. But back in the day, I had a freshwater aquarium like most of you had. For those of you that have a saltwater tank or had a saltwater tank, did you have a freshwater aquarium first? Yes? It always starts that way, right? So I had a freshwater tank and then I walked into my pet store and saw that. The like most iconic saltwater fish ever. I saw that and I said, wow, I want one of those. And my dad, who has a very good job of listening, well, 1989 Christmas Day, I walked downstairs, lo and behold, the gift that I didn't even know I was dreaming about, my first saltwater tank, the 75 gallon oceanic with the awesome oak wood trim. Did anyone have that tank? There you go. Always, like everyone, if you're in the hobby back then, you had that tank. So that was my first tank. Check out the under gravel filter. Anyone still use that? Okay, good. I don't have to give that talk, but how many of you were in the hobby in 1989? Anyone? Yeah, everyone's always like, it's all right. So if you were in the hobby back then, you remember this. If you're in the hobby now, this might seem like craziness, which is perfect. So this was live rock back in the day. The red barnacles, for those of you that had a tank back then, did you have that? Like pretty much everyone had that. So back in the day, we couldn't really keep coral. So we got dead coral and skeletons and the idea was to keep them perfectly clean. Anyone have the Blue Ridge Coral? Like that was an awesome one. So once a month-ish, you took all the rock, which was coral skeletons, out of your tank and you bleached them because how cool you were was dictated on how white and colorful those things were. We couldn't understand why we crashed tanks, but luckily we're a little bit smarter now. So I went on in the saltwater aquarium hobby. I decided I wanted to get a sea anemone. So I went to my local fish store and said, hey, I want to get an anemone. They said, well, you're going to need a more powerful light. Made sense to me. So they sold me a black light. Yeah, not so much. Then we could start keeping Xenia. Does anyone have this in their tank? Anyone wish they didn't have that in their tank? Hand, same hands always go up. All right, so let's fast forward a little bit. This was early 90s, how we did things. About 2006 for my birthday, my wife shows up with one of these. It says, happy birthday. And I look at it and I go, do you have the receipt? She's like, yeah, I got the receipt. I'm like, awesome. We're going to take it back and make it a saltwater tank. She's like, okay. So this was the first saltwater tank when I got back into the hobby. And the tank progression kind of went like this. Seven, 25, 20 gallons, 55 gallons, 90 gallons, 225. Now I'm at 987. I don't have a problem with tanks, I promise. Anyone not want a bigger tank? No one's hands ever goes up. Anyone wish they had a smaller tank? Everyone's happy with the tank size they have? This guy's raising his hand. So you may look at that and say, what the heck? Why would you have this many tanks? Well, look, the first lesson I've learned, not only with my tank, also with client tanks that I build for them, your new tank, whether you think it's big or not, in six months or less, you're going to think it's small. It happens every single time. I put in a tank for someone, they're like, wow, look at all this space. I come back three and six months and they're like, yeah, I should have gone bigger. So if you're thinking about a bigger tank and you're thinking maybe you want a 120, but you had the space for a 180, go for the 180. And if you can do a 225, do that. Because in three to six months, it's gonna seem small. And look, no one tears down a tank after three months because they're like, oh yeah, I wanna get another 50 gallons. Let's just tear that down and start over. So buy a bigger tank. And by the way, if you come back from this presentation, you want to sell it to your spouse, you have my permission to get a bigger tank. If you get in trouble, don't call me. All right, I went to a 20, to a 55, to a 90. How many of you have had the 55 gallon tank? Four feet long, about one, one, see like, 
half of the people. Happens every time. Everyone's had that tank. So this was me filling up the 90 gallon tank. That tank progressed to about here and I had some nice corals in here. So this was a Saturday morning about nine o'clock. This is Saturday afternoon about one o'clock. This is Saturday afternoon about two o'clock. It takes days, years to build and it takes a couple hours to tear the whole thing down, which isn't bad if you're moving, which I'll talk about that in a minute. But my big lesson out of my 90 gallon tank, keep in mind, this was my first big tank that I had when I got back into the saltwater tank hobby. I had no money whatsoever. The part lesson for me to learn there was being cheap is expensive, which like, how does that work? Look, like I said, I had no funds. What I would do is I would set up a group buy with the local reef club. We would all pool our money buy stuff and then I would take the cash that people gave me, put the transaction that we bought from an online coral vendor on my credit card, take the cash and pay my mortgage. Not a good idea, but just to give you an idea of how little funds I had back then. So I would go out and try to buy the cheapest stuff that I could find. Protein skimmer's biggest example. I had the hang on back protein skimmer, which never ever worked. If you're thinking about a hang on back skimmer, don't. It just, they never work, period. So I started with the cheaper one and then that didn't work so well and it broke, I had to go get another one. But I was like, I can't get the nice one because I don't have that money. In the end, I ended up spending twice as much money and have three times the amount of headaches. So being cheap is expensive. I always say, look, I was too poor to be cheap. I'm still too poor now to be cheap. Whenever I try to go cheap, it costs me more money, costs me more time and more headaches. Who got into the saltwater tank hobby because they wanted a headache? Exactly, no one. Ever happens, never ever happens. All right, lessons from my 90 gallon tank. You're always gonna overflow your mixing station. A lot of you have a mixing station. How many of you do? Make your own salt water? If you have it in your garage or somewhere where if you overflow it, it's not that big of a deal, especially if it's somewhere where you can hide it from your spouse before you get to clean it up, awesome. Because I promise you, you're going to overflow your mixing station every single time. You have reminders on your phone, you put things around your neck to remind you, doesn't work, you will overflow it. So if you're thinking of building a mixing station, Put it somewhere when you overflow it and put 20, maybe 50, 100 gallons of water on your floor, it's not the end of the world. Or somewhere where you can clean it up quickly. <clears throat> also, 90 gallon tank is a really nice size. The nice thing about 90 gallons is they're a little taller than most tanks, so it's free real estate. So that was my 90 gallon tank. Had that up for a couple years. That got me started in Mr. Saltwater Tank TV. And then I moved. I actually moved from Austin, Texas to Franklin, Tennessee and got myself a 225 gallon rimless tank. How many of you remember this tank? Have you been with me that long on the show? A couple of you? Awesome. So this is a rimless tank, meaning there's no bracing across the top. And when I set this tank up, I thought, look, I'm gonna set up a new tank. Everything's gonna go great. I'm gonna show the world. And then I had a majorly hard lesson learned with this one. This one was really hard to swallow, quarantine every single fish that comes into your tank. What you don't wanna do is be like me and get to go on the internet and say, hey, I'm draining my tank because I messed up. I don't have a problem doing that if you all learn from it. But let me tell you, it's not fun. Even if you don't have to go on the internet and tell the whole world that you messed up and have a permanent record of it on the internet, it's still not fun to do. It was a very hard lesson learned. I lost $3,000 worth of livestock in about three days. Come in every morning, and there'd be another three to four half dozen fish dead, including fish that I'd had for years out of my 90 gallon tank. So quarantine every fish that goes into your tank. Now, I understand some people are like, I've tried quarantining, it didn't work. Or I don't want to quarantine. I understand that if you don't want to do it yourself, buy it from someone who does. There are places online like Live Aquaria, Marine Collectors, Live Aquaria's Divers Den, Marine Collectors, those guys will quarantine the fish for you. Now I still recommend that you at least put that fish in a holding tank, observe it, quarantine it yourself. But if you're not willing to do that, buy it from someone who does. Your local fish store may do it. You do what you don't want to do is buy it and slap it right into your tank. I was giving a talk like this before that event happened. Someone said, hey, do you quarantine? I said, no, I don't quarantine. I've never had a problem. Two weeks later, I was losing everything. I went years and got away with it, but then I got hit by that bullet. So don't do what I do, quarantine everything. It just takes one fish that brings something in and everything can be wiped out. Sometimes the hardest lesson learned, the hardest mistakes you make are the big lessons learned. This happened to me. I was able to rebuild the tank. These were the first two fish that went back into the tank, which got quarantined before they went in. This is a blue throat trigger fish. This is a blonde naso. This photo was taken in 2012. That blonde naso is still with me today. So I <clears throat> she's at least 10 years old because that's how long I've had her. So she's been a great fish. You can have a lot of success with that. So I learned that lesson but I moved on. Someone told me once in the saltwater aquarium hobby, really success is this, this, this depends on how many times you've totally messed up 
and you've stayed in the hobby and kept with it. Now, I want you to learn from my mistakes so you don't have to go through that. But look, mistakes do happen. Hiccups come along the way. Second lesson learned from my 225 gallon tank, rimless tanks just really aren't that much fun. Look, they look great. I mean, they look very sleek. You can look at them out there. Planet Aquarium has some. If you like to look great, here's the thing about them. To really make them function, because you want fish in that tank, you have to put a lid on them of some sort. And usually that's done with a mesh screen top, which ruins the look of a rimless tank. It's like driving around a Maserati with little 14 inch mag wheels. You'd be like, what the heck is that? That totally ruins the look of the car. You need to have a, a lid on them of some sort. It totally ruins the rimless tanks. Then you get your hand in there, you're moving your algae scraper, water comes up over the top and then you wipe it all over the front of your tank. So I'm not a fan of rimless. That was luckily not a hard lesson learned for me because I moved every year. So I was able to move. I didn't even want to move the tank. Like, I don't like it. Here's the opportunity to get rid of it and get a bigger tank. <laughs> Which, if you're thinking of moving and you want to move your tank, that's the best time to upgrade. I don't recommend you move the same tank you have. Use that opportunity to get a big one. Why not? I went to a 375 gallon tank. Now, I was moving every year. I don't recommend that especially if you have saltwater tanks. It's not much fun. Moving a saltwater tank is not fun. If you really want to do it, talk to Raj. He's in the back. He has an aquarium company. He'll be happy to do it for you. Um, I hope you have a high limit on your card. So I had a 375, which only lasted for a year because I moved again. And I had a 225, which only lasted for a year. Lesson there is don't move every year if you have a saltwater tank. Lesson five, the 12 month mark on your tank is a big milestone. Now, I didn't get to hit this milestone because I moved every year for a couple of years. So I kind of had to learn this one the hard way. These two tanks never got a chance to show what they could do because I never hit that 12 month milestone. Now, I tell clients when I'm building them a tank, the first 12 months of your tank's life, it's like an underage child. They kick and scream, they're happy, and the next minute they're upset and you didn't change a thing, you don't know why. Your tank just has to get itself worked out and it has to mature. So if your tank is young and things aren't going that great, hang with it, it may just be a matter of time, your tank has to mature. So I said I had both of these tanks up for a year. Well, then I moved again. This time I bought a house, so I didn't have to deal with landlords. And of course, I took my own advice and I got a bigger tank. So I went from a 375 to a 450 gallon tank. The best way to get that into your house is grab a forklift and just lift it up. I mean, why not? And you get to operate the forklift because they leave you the keys, it's a lot of fun. And you just hire some movers and they move it into place and you're done. This was the easiest tank move ever. I should say second one ever, because I'll talk about the easiest ever, but just put it in through the window, natural reef junkie stuff, right? So then I had a 300, uh, sorry, a 450 gallon tank. And coming back to that 12 month part, same thing happened in this tank. The first 12 months, things went okay. And then the next moment they weren't okay and you didn't change the thing. So I was like, what's going on with my tank? Once I hit 12 months, it's like a switch went on. The things just got locked in and the tank really started to mature. This is my sea bay and enemy that, uh, was not happy until that point. After that point, it took off. Got, I got it about this big. When I tore the tank down, it was easily 18 inches across. Things just started growing. Who wouldn't want to have some of these corals in their tank? I had a lot of success with this tank, and it really didn't kick in until that 12-month milestone. So again, if you have a small tank, hang in there. Your tank needs to mature. <clears throat> now, why is that? Well, look, someone very smart who's actually here at the conference this weekend and he reminded me that, look, when you're building a saltwater tank and you're growing, setting one up, having it mature, you're really not just building a saltwater tank and getting things going, you're really growing biofilm. So bacteria processes have to get up and going in the tank. It has to mature. That happens in the first 12 months. And then you also stop doing this. You have new shiny object syndrome. You're like, oh, I got a new tank. I want to change this. I'm going to put my hand in there. I'm going to fiddle with this. I'm going to get this piece of gear. Tanks really like to be just left alone. People that are always fiddling with their tank, things don't tend to go well. So about the 12 month part, 12 month mark, you're kind of like, yeah, I like my tank, but you know, you're okay not looking at it for a couple days and you will find your tank usually does better. Also, probably around the 12 month mark, your tank is fully stocked. You're not putting fish in there. You, you're probably always gonna be putting coral in your tank because we do that. But for the most part, you're leaving it alone. Lesson now learned then was learn to listen to your tank. Your tank's gonna tell you what it wants. Your spouse would probably say the same thing. You just have to learn to listen because we have these things called ideal tank parameters. I love it when people say this. And this is where they say they should be. pH of 8.3, here's your alkalinity. You know, if you're not in these ranges, 
then uh, <clears throat> things aren't going to go well. These are ideal. Here's what I have to say about that. That's my tank buddy, whatever. I want you to do what your tank is happy with. It will tell you what it's happy with. That coral was grown in a tank with 25 nitrates and two phosphates. Not 0 0.2, 2 0.0. Does it look okay to you all? I rest my case. Again, this was all in a high nutrient type of tank. Instead of trying to fit it into the ideal tank parameter box, I said, this looks okay. Anyone not like that photo? This looks fine. Why am I trying to fit my tank into a box? It's telling me it's happy. Just give it what it wants and let it reward me. So your tank will tell you what it wants. Listen and just say yes, dear, and keep giving it that. Lesson seven, moving water eight feet away is hard. To give you a sense of scale, this tank is eight feet long. This is a peninsula tank, meaning you can walk around it. So for a long time, I didn't have any power heads on this side of the tank. Some people would say it ruins the look. The point is the flow is all coming from that end. And it's eight feet from over there to over here. Getting water from over there to over here with just power heads is hard. You really can't get it enough flow down here without absolutely blasting everything over there. Or it's a really big power head that doesn't look good at all. So if you're thinking about a larger tank, you want a peninsula, getting water down, movement down here is hard. Two ways you can manage that, three actually. One, you can not put any coral down here and no one wants to do that. You can put power heads on it, which is what I had to do because I needed the flow. Or you can use a closed loop system. My experience with closed loops, you still really can't get the flow you want if you have a lot of SPS down here. So you're still gonna have to add some power heads to that tank. I had this tank for three years, four years. And then I decided I'd tear it down because who doesn't say that? I think I want a bigger tank. How many of you look at your tank and you're like, yeah, I think I want a bigger tank. Everyone not raising their hands because their spouse is next to them. They're like, I don't want to admit that. <laughs> but for me to have a bigger tank, I didn't have the space in the house. So add on to the house. Why not? Right? There you go. She's, she's like, we did that. Like, Why not? That's a natural reef junkie thing to do. Just go out the back of the house. I got room for a fish room now. Let's just add on to the home. And the tank's going to be on the second story. I'm going to put thousand gallon tank on the second story of my house. I have to put up some steel to do that. Not a problem. We're adding on. We'll get that put in. Uh, here's the house coming together. And then here's the finished product. Okay. Lesson number eight. Remember how I said putting the tank in through the window is like second easiest move ever? The easiest move ever is a crane day. Moving a tank with a crane is really easy. Raj can relate to this because you go, I want it right there. And they go, okay. And you just sit there and you watch, which is what happened to me. I said, I want the tank in the second story. You got to feed it through the window. I said, all right, no problem. So they showed up with the crane and then they take it off the truck and I'm just watching. Okay, I was lying, I'm filming, but you don't have to do anything because they do all the work for you. And if they drop it, they get to buy you another tank, not you. The neighbors love it, by the way. All the kids came out of the neighborhood. I'm the weirdo with the big fish tank who craned it in. I'm proud of that fact. Yeah, you just tell them where you want it and they put it right in for you. Easy. You just thread it in through the window and then you set it into place. Done. So that was the tank going in. Here's the tank now. This is a 987 gallon drop off tank to give you a sense of scale. It is 12 feet long. This section is four feet deep. This section is 30 inches deep. This is two feet across down here. Remember what I said about it's hard to move water eight feet away. It's also harder to move water 12 feet away. So I have pumps, power heads on the end of the tank here. I also have a closed loop system in here. I had to do that. Now, some people would say it ruins the peninsula look, but look, you can't throw water that far and get the flow you need. So the fun thing about a peninsula is you get three different views. This is the deep section. And then this is the back side of the tank. If you're thinking about a new tank, remember buy a bigger one than you think you need. Number two, you have my permission to get a bigger tank. Number three, if you can get a peninsula tank, you'll love it you'll probably never have another tank again because you get three tanks in one. This tank is now 14 months old, 13 months old. Yes, I have coral in there. And one big lesson that I forgot, we forget as reefers, how many of you got into the saltwater tank hobby because you saw a fish or you liked the fish first? That was your first love. Really? So the rest of you saw coral and you said, I want that. And then you got a saltwater tank. This tank is reminding me that fish can be more rewarding than coral. I'm not saying I don't have any coral in the tank, but I'm really enjoying the fish in this system. I have a thousand gallons of water volume. I was able to get some fish, some holy grail type fish for me, like my banded angel right here. That's a little dude there. No, he doesn't nip on anything. <clears throat> this is them eating off the automatic feeder. 
I like in the coral in the tank. I'm still a reefer. I'm putting coral in the tank, but I'm really enjoying having this fish in this system. It is reminding me how much joy I get out of just having fish. This is my fish uh, smashing nori. There's the banded angel again. Uh, everyone always asks what these guys are. Those are pyramid butterflies. They do not nip coral. If you're wanting a butterfly in your reef tank, they're fantastic. And as I said earlier, I was able to get some holy grail type fish. This is a lineatus wrasse, very great fish. They like to jump. He will jump about once a week inside of the canopy. I hear him ping around like ping pong, and then he falls back in. So if you're thinking about this fish, really any wrasse, make sure you have a lid on your tank. All right, and sometimes I have to remind myself lessons that I preach to people that I forget, mistakes I made again. When everything is happy with your tank, really talking about fish at this point because we never stop buying coral. When all your fish are happy, that's a great time to stop. And that's one of the hardest things for us to do. You're like, oh, look at that fish. I forgot about that fish. Or no, I can go get this fish. I just want to add one more fish. How many of you snow ski? I'm in Florida. That's a bad question to ask. I was always told that when you're a snow skier, the last thing you do is go, okay, this is my last run. Because you always crash, you always get hurt on your last run. Same thing with a fish tank. When you're done, don't be like, oh, I'm just going to add one more fish. Or when you're done, say you're done and actually stick to it. I got to eat my own medicine on this one. I was like, oh, I'd like to have just one more tank. I'm going to get a purple tank. I'd love to have a purple tank to cap off my fish. All my tanks were happy with one another. It's like, I'll get a purple tank. They're usually mean. No. This is a purple tank getting harassed, which happened nonstop for two days. He actually ended up just giving up. He was in the corner of my tank. I came with the net and he literally was like, thank you. Jumped into the net. <clears throat> He's now living in my refugium. So when you have your fish that you, and everyone's happy, especially if everyone's getting along, be like, I'm done. Then you actually have to stop. I know it's hard. I got to eat my own medicine on this one. What are the big takeaways that I can tell you? If you learn nothing else from this presentation, remember this. In three, in three to six months, your tank is going to feel small. So if you're thinking about a big one, and you can go 90, get a 120. If you can do a 120, do a 180. Go bigger. The other fun thing about tank builds, the price difference between a 225 and like a 280, assuming you keep the length and the width the same, is usually negligible. Yes, you have to buy a bigger stand and a little bigger tank, but the amount of lights that you need on a 225 versus the 280 is the same. So you're not paying for that. Maybe you need a little bit more sand, which isn't that expensive. You might need 50 more pounds of live rock or dry rock, not that expensive. So don't think that if you're like, oh, I'm gonna get a 225, I'd love to have a 280, but I can't afford it. Do the math, price the whole thing out because you may be surprised. And remember, in three to six months, it's gonna feel small and always, always quarantine every fish coming into your tank. It was heartbreaking to watch some fish that I had for years get sick and then die especially knowing that I could have prevented it and I made the mistake. If you're not willing to quarantine them, buy them from someone who does. Give your fish the best chance going forward and yourself the best chance for success because we all got into this hobby to have fun and enjoy it. No one got into the hobby for a headache. And with that, thank you for being here. Thanks for taking your time. I will answer questions if you have any. <clears throat> so the question is, as a fish keeper, what do I find the most challenging? Hmm. That's a good question. I haven't been asked that one before, so couple pieces to that. One, since the pandemic started, getting fish has gotten to be quite challenging. Most fish traveled on passenger international flights. There weren't a lot of passenger international flights during the pandemic. They're still not even now. So getting fish can be hard and you're paying a lot more. I used to pay like $75 a box when I would bring fish in. Now I'm paying $300, $350 a box. Air freight's gone sky high because everyone wants on that plane. There's less capacity than everyone wants on it. So getting fish has been harder because there's not as many people shipping. And then they're also a lot more expensive. So that's been a challenge for me. Also, as I said in my talk, like stopping. I should have put that purple tank in my tank. I've just been like, I'm good. I'd love to have it, but everyone's happy. Let's just leave it alone. Getting myself to stop was hard. I mean, one thing that I don't want to say is hard, but I would say when I think about my fish and it's been very successful with me about adding fish to a tank is I always like to buy small. I don't like to take a big fish. I know they look great in a big tank, but I like to start with small fish and let them grow into the tank. I've seen fish like my Nasa tank. I got her, she was about three inches. She grew to about four and a half in my 225 and then she seemed to stall out. I put her in my eight foot 375 and then she picked it up another inch and a half. She went from my eight foot 450 to now my 12 foot 
987, my thousand gallon reef, and she's picked up another two inches on herself. So let them grow to the tank. Um, they can be, but they, again, she like once. It's like they can sense when they're in a bigger tank. But she went from a five foot tank to an eight foot tank. She grew and then it stopped. Like in three months, she picked up the size and then she stopped again. So I like to buy small fish and let them grow to the tank. Uh, what size is my quarantine tank and what kind of equipment do I run? So I have a couple quarantine tanks. Easiest quarantine tank to have, depending on what you're quarantining, like most smaller fish, you can get by with a 20. If you can get a 40 gallon breeder, that's a great size because it's three feet long, you got a little more length. If I'm quarantining tanks, I like to keep them in something four foot long. Like there's some gray area here. Like I'm not a fan of the argument of like, well, it's, I'm putting a small tank in a small tank, so therefore it's okay. Like quarantine, it's temporary. So again, I like to buy small fish. So if I'm putting a smaller tank in a 40 gallon breeder for 14, 30 days, I'm okay with it. That tank has big PVC elbows in it, like three or four inch where they can go in there and hide. I have a hang on back filter and I have a heater and lit in the light. It's, it's pretty simple. I mean, quarantine, as I say, it's not the Gaylord. You know, it's not the nicest place in the world, but it's very easy to sterilize. It's very easy to use medication. Quarantining is a contact sport. You gotta be in there like watching them every day. Because a big part of quarantining for me is not only disease prevention and treatment, but also it's getting the fish used to me and getting them on my routine. So I want them to eat what I'm feeding them. And you think about it, I mean, in my quarantine talk, I talk about imagine getting thrown into the middle of China alone and you're like, I don't know anyone here. I don't speak this language. Is that person nice? Is this person not? You're like, I'm hungry. Unless you're going to KFC, you're going to go order Chinese food and you're going to be like, I don't know if I should eat this. I don't want to eat this. So you're dealing with all that at once. The fish is the same thing. You put the fish in your tank. It might have someone beating up on it. It might be stressed from transport. Then you're going to throw some food at it that it's never seen while it's trying to deal with the stress. So quarantine lets me work with them, get them on my food so I can eliminate all those variables before they go in the tank. The question was, how long do I quarantine my fish? I quarantine for 30 days. So I prophylactically treat my fish against ick and marine velvet because those are the two big things. Marine velvet is what took down my 225 gallon tank. So that's a 14 day treatment and then I'm using the rest of the time to observe them and get them used to me and on my foods. What size tank would I start out with? Great question. If you can do the 55, I like that tank. There's usually a lot of them on Craigslist because they're very popular freshwater tanks that people tend to unload. And you can usually get them for like 100 bucks. It's four feet long, it's about a foot wide and about a foot tall. It's not real big. Yeah, and like if you can't do that, 40 gallon breeder is a nice size as well. Yeah, so they got a 75 gallon system that someone gave them, which is a great size as well. I wouldn't have a problem with you starting with that size tank. Yeah, so the silicone on the seams though, or it's probably an old system. Do you know how old it is? Okay, so it's probably at least 10 years old. I tell people the last thing between all the water in your tank and the floor is that seam. Now, the silicone that's outside of where the two pieces of glass are meet doesn't really add any structural integrity to it. But at the end of the day, are you gonna risk it? Especially if you spend your time and effort, you set up this new tank and then you come in and it's leaking. 75 gallon tank isn't that expensive. I would take the time and replace the tank, especially if you already have the stand and it's in good shape and you have the sump and everything. Okay, so you can build a stand or buy one as well. It's like tires on your car, you know? If that goes, everything goes to hell in a handbasket fast, so I would take that opportunity and just replace that tank. Because you're not gonna set it up and then six months into it be like, oh, I think I wanna replace the tank. Like, so now's the time to do it. Yes, ma'am. What type of corals do I keep? So I have all types of corals. I started with zoanthids. Those are my first love. They're very colorful coral. Uh, they were in the talk. For those of you that don't know, let me show you that real quick. Very easy to keep coral that are not that expensive. You can get all the colors of the rainbow. And again, they're easy to keep. Those are the rainbows. So I like those. Those are great starter coral. You know, a lot, some people don't like SPS to hard corals. I moved into that, but start with some soft corals and then you can move into LPS and SPS if you want. But if you're looking for something to start with, these are a good one to go with. Love these. I still love these. Even though they're a soft coral and a lot of hard coral guys are like, we're the best because we're a hard coral people. Look down on soft corals. I love zoas. I have a zoa garden in my tank. I could probably never buy enough of them. Any other questions? 
Well, that's a good question. Uh, what would I do differently in my 987 gallon tank? I would move the closed loopholes around because they're not quite where I wanted them. Um, and I would probably put a couple more closed loopholes in it because it's just, even at 12 feet long to try to get in a flow in the center is hard. I mean, the closed loop helps, but I, I would have moved things around. I don't think, I would have made the drop off about six inches longer um, on the bottom part. I made it, I did one for a client that was three feet and then mine's two feet and I wanted to have more length up top, but I probably would have gone another six inches in terms of length on the drop off. And no, I don't want a bigger tank yet. All right, I'm gonna wrap it up so the next person come in. If you have questions, I'll be up in front. I can answer those. Thanks for being here. Have a great rest of your show, great rest of your weekend and uh, I'll be around. Thanks everyone.